over the years I've gotten to know uh, someone who's been quite instrumental in SVG as a standard um, and he's now working at Adobe. One of his more recent contributions was um, writing the um, SVG export from or for Illustrator. Uh, so since I know him and since I love SVG um, I thought I'd share... let's try to get that mirrored, there we go. Um, how this actually works, how to optimize. So I've taken the this is not the editable, editable version because I don't really care about that. Um, what I've got over here is a whole lot of paths. So every single letter is a separate path. Uh, Chion did mention that you should link those together because every single um, attribute in SVG is a separate path and then the, like, the coordinates after that. So if you merge all of those together, you save every single path. You basically link them. The best way of doing it is to actually grab everything of the same colour. Let me just... Uh, so I've grabbed a whole lot of black there, for example, and I'll merge those together. So that's now one path, um, and the result in SVG will be a lot smaller. So basically, every single black element on this in this SVG, you merge into one. Um, this is obviously destructive, so you only do this as you're exporting and you'd merge all the red, all the green, all the... what, that, that's pink or something? Merge all those together. Unfortunately there's no non-illustrator um, way of doing this. SVGO? Like, you still use SVG Go. No, SVG Go. Oh, SV yeah, you still so. use that, yeah. but the illustrator way is... that like, can reduce the file sizes yeah. compared to, I think, at it's least from my tinkering. I'm not sure how well SVG Go does it in like this case, but typically if paths are spread out in the same color, yeah, it'll like work it out. It yeah. Now the main thing that I'm going to pay any attention to, so I'm just going to save. I'll call that dot export. <coughs> now this is the key dialog. I know this is quite small on the screen. Um, we're using presentation attributes, not internal styles or CSS. Um, that gives you the easiest thing to override. If you've got black, you don't need to set a color at all because by default any path in uh, SVG without a color is set to black. Um, we're embedding images, but we don't usually want any anyway. ID is set to minimal because you don't want any of those scattered through. Uh, SVG will take a lot of that stuff out anyway. But this one at the end is probably the most important, setting the decimals to one. Um, NASA managed to get to Pluto using four decimal points. You don't need that many to render an SVG. Um, but this is one of those things that you need to do really careful, carefully because if you export too few decimal points, by default you try it on one but then you need to actually inspect your final <coughs> SVG because sometimes if the SVG is really complex um, it will be not fine enough so maybe you'll need two decimal points but that's basically a big difference. If you think for every single coordinate shaving three or four characters off depends on how many points you're at originally that reduces your file size down significantly. Um, I'm also going to minify because I want it to. I'm not going to do responsive. That takes off the coordinates. So let's have a look. So I've, I've gone from 793k to 116. This is a bit unfair because the 793 is not being optimized. Uh, do you know how big yours is, the final one? You can try exporting as and using SVG on, on the minified Yeah. I'm curious to see, like, without having gone any further, what the best one is. Oh, which one? Sorry. The last second. This one? Yeah. Well, tell me 319. Yeah. So just by going through Illustrator, I've dropped it by about a third. And most of that is down to the decimal points. Um, it's probably possible to do, do this through SVGO, um, but the Illustrator way is really fast. So if you've got the designer, whoever's actually come up with it, or if you are happy with Illustrator yourself, um, ask the designer to do it for you, show them what to do, or work it out yourself, and then run it through SVGO at the end, or any kind of optimizer from there. Um, but it makes a huge, huge difference on the size of the SVGs. Good. Any questions on SVG optimization? Thank you. What's next?
Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> ah. What kind of hack have we got up next? Wow! <laughs> <coughs> I need to actually do this with my notes because I'm really badly prepared. So I'm just going to copy that. And... Hang on. I'm really, really badly repaired, prepared for this. I can't really emphasize that enough. Um, where are my notes? Ah. Let's try that. Hey. <coughs> um, now this is not CSS related, but it's like wider scope of world related. Um, one thing that I'm painfully aware of in my own office and looking around the room at the, the makeup here is there aren't very many women in software development. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this, but there are things that we can actually do about it, basically breaking down the barriers to make things more friendly. Um, in my current role, I'm an engineering manager. Um, I have no women reporting to me in my software team, um, which is terrible, basically. I'll go into what balance actually means. So. What I've started doing is researching what I can do about it because I'm not just going to sit there and say, oh well, we didn't get any women applying, so, you know, too hard, didn't try. Um, there's a lot that you can actually do. And I'm determined to try to improve the gender balance in my company. Um, I should say the company I work for is, like, predominantly women. Uh, my CEO, I think seven out of ten executives are women. Um, like the, it's fantastic it's a really great company to work for except in our software development section where I think we've got two women now out of how many are we Fred 20 something yeah and climbing and it's yeah it's not good enough um, so I, instead of sitting on my hands and complaining about it I'm trying to do something about it I'm also really horribly prepared for today because I haven't spent enough time on it so I'm going to call this part one and I'll, well, I'll get back to it over time because I'm really determined to actually make a difference here. Um, and when you talk about gender diversity, you see nice companies like this one. Um, oh wait, this is Uber. This is one of the worst companies out there at the moment. Um, this just came out today actually. This is Uber's attempt to say, hey, we're a nice place to work for. Percentage-wise, this is about like less than 10% of their workforce, and right now, every single one of these people is probably brushing up their CV to get out of there. So there's when you talk about gender diversity or just diversity in general, um, I'm not really interested in Uber per se because I would hope that the culture like that is not one that pervades in the company I work for. You're always at risk of things like that happening. Uh, if anyone's not aware, um, Uber's basically done one stupid chauvinistic and racist thing after another recently um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this is exactly why they put this thing out to show that they're not like that at all, even though they're having a great deal of difficulty retaining their staff. Um, but the problem is that really starting in the 80s when personal computers came about, the marketing at the time was towards boys and men. I mean, PCs at the time were, you know, toys, basically. They didn't really do all that much. In the early history of computing, I mean, uh, Ada Lovelace in the 1800s, uh, a woman came up with the concept of programming originally. Um, like basically, the pioneers of computing were women, without doubt. You look through NASA's history, you look through uh, the US military, Grace Hopper, uh, who invented the compiler, um, there's uh, Hedy Lamarr, the actress, who instead of partying at night, basically sat in her um, bedroom and invented Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, all these pioneers up to a certain point, and then everything dropped off. And around that time was the introduction of personal computers. The theory that I've best seen is that it's really down to that marketing at the time that computers are for boys and for men and we've got an early generation where it's just not something that girls do. 
so we had this really fantastic situation where um, like the gender balance was like pretty even through to the point where um, everything just went really bad and has continued going that way and we again we can sit here and say like oh well too bad but uh, I'm not the kind of person who does that I'd rather actually do something about it um, one of the problems that we often have and especially through our hiring methods is we we think we're hiring for mer uh, in a meritocracy so we look at how well someone does we judge them we'll ask some technical questions in interviews and we'll assess whether they're good or even in their jobs based on that in practice we are so full of unconscious biases that it just doesn't work that way at all um, and this applies to all sorts of different measures as soon as you're a minority in anything the odds are stacked against you if you're an ethnic minority if you're a gender minority uh, male female you might be gay lesbian anything along those lines as soon as you are not the majority then you have everything stacked against you and no matter how much you might be aware of this the odds are not in your favor um, so when you say that hey we've got a nice meritocracy I only promote the people who do really well I'm not really you know consciously preventing women from going up through my hierarchy you actually are unless you're addressing it properly if you're really thinking about what you're doing um, we heard before where's Alex gone has Alex gone I was, I've been reading about the cultures and the like. One of the things you mentioned is like, yeah, we have beers and things like that. How many women generally join in on beers? Like, culturally, it's not as common as men. Like, looking at the demographics, and I've researched into this, if you advertise that for your company, I, I hate to call them out because I'm sure they're a great company to work for, but these are the kinds of things that we think, yeah, this is great. Like, we have a great culture. This is what we do. Yet the women hearing this are just like, oh, that's not my thing you're not going to get people applying for you and with all the best intentions in the world unless you're actually thinking about this really carefully then you're going to be putting up barriers to stop people um, applying for your jobs in the first place because this for me is where I'm at I need to think about um, from the application process from our job ads to the hiring process how we're preventing minorities from joining in um, I know within my own company we've got a really good ethnic diversity, we've just got a really serious gender uh, imbalance. One thing that's common is um, there's the confidence gap which is linked to imposter syndrome and essentially it reduces the number of applicants from those minor groups and then we have uh, confirmation bias which reinforces the negative ex experiences. So to give you an example, if if I was a minority, I apply for a job, I get rejected. It's like, well, I probably shouldn't have applied for the thing in the first place. Basically, confidence levels are lower when you're in minority. Um, and there's been a study on this. Male applicants will apply for a job when they meet 30% of requirements. Female applicants will apply when they meet 80% of requirements. Like, that is ridiculous. You think your job ads are even and equal, but it's not the case at all. One of the things we can do about that is by changing the wording. And as soon as you have more than five requirements listed on a job ad, you're dropping off your minority application rates right there because you're making those barriers too high. And what it, one of the things that it does get down to is instead of listing, we need three years experience in this particular thing, something like that, you need to target the skills rather than the technology. Um, especially based on the concept of the 30, you know, 80% requirements versus 30 for women, uh, for men, sorry. Um, so changing your job ads around where you're looking for, I mean, what skills do I really need for someone to work in my company? Um, and key things that, I mean, for me, when I'm looking for a good job, I want something that's got flexible work hours, I want good collaboration. Um, given generally with gender roles that women if they have kids will need more flexible work hours than men if you don't have something like that baked into your company if you're expecting people to work late every day or work on weekends or never take a day off because their child is sick then you're not going to attract the right kind of candidates but it's not just a matter of having a policy for it you need to live and breathe it otherwise you just won't sustain um, the applicants I mean, the drop-off rates for men in the first 10 years in tech, 17% of men will change to another industry. 
and I think I can't remember the exact number it's about 67% of women will drop out of the industry usually that means they'll start into computer science or something along those lines and then they'll go into a parallel industry where they're still using their tech skills but the culture is more um, in line with a happy place for them to work so it's like the bro culture basically needs to go away and we need to be that friendly uh, collaborative workplace I'm kind of going beyond my initial job stuff here to an extent something else that makes a difference is imagery I'd be happy to work for this company if I didn't know what the name was. Um, so when you have images, if they're on your website, if they're on your job ads or anything else like that, you need to use those minorities. I mean, Uber's doing this really well in this, apart from the fact that they're Uber and don't mean it. <laughs> really. I guess they mean it too. They're just, yeah. Did you read it? Yeah, a few pretty loud people. Did you read about the yeah, South Korean thing? I mean... <laughs> I don't know how much they mean it. Um, there are some technical tools as well. There's one called Textio um, that will do a text analysis with machine, like based on machine learning on your job ads to, uh, to weed out anything that has any kind of gender bias or um, any other kind of bias towards minorities. Um, I'm still going based on my preliminary research here because I haven't really done all that much. Um, automated co-tests work really well um, there's also I think it's called headless um, applications basically you take the names off CVs and you, universities as well but I don't know if that really means much to anyone it doesn't to me um, if you take a name off um, I saw for a uh, there's a Trop Fest which is a film festival in Australia uh, from last year they had one female finalist out of, fifth, out of 16 this year they took the names off the applications, it was 50% women. And there's, I mean, you can talk about differences in maybe the women had a whole lot more successful movies that particular year, but it just seems unlikely. And this is the, the hidden biases, where we're not even thinking about it, but we see a minority and it's like, oh, maybe they're just not going to be as good or something. Um, having automated code tests as part of the hiring process can help with that. So, um, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of an automated test is you have a set test that's given to someone, it's graded based on how well they do or don't, and there's no human interaction into that, so you've got as level a question as possible. There are still potential flaws in that you might be going for something that's too technical um, in, the, in the code test that you're providing, which may skew you towards certain people, um, but it's still something to think about. The next section for interviewing is in structured behavioural interviewing. Um, and the concept behind that is that if I'm interviewing two separate people for the same role with the same skill set, I will ask the same questions and I'll note down my results so I've got a fair comparison. If you allow it to go based on what you feel or what you think, then your biases are kicking in. Whether you're aware of it or not, we're all like, you know, if I think there's something like a, uh, a success rate for hiring is like way below 20% like for the number of successful hires for an interview and what people actually think and how someone actually performs. Um, generally speaking, humans are terrible at hiring other people. And because we're so bad at that, it makes hiring minorities even worse. Um, further on interviewing, uh, asking multifaceted questions where there's not just one answer also opens it up to different approaches. Because when we're hiring someone, we don't want everyone in our team to be exactly the same. We really want someone to come in and challenge what we're doing. Because otherwise, we're just going to turn out the same thing that tomorrow is we're doing today. And that's not a good way to actually change your company. The reason we don't like this as humans, and the reason we fight against it and interview against it and hire against it, is we're scared of change. It's just part of human nature. It's the way we've evolved. We like tomorrow to be the same as today. So when a candidate comes along and challenges your way of thinking, then you're automatically going to be against them. And when someone is from a minority, then it's all the more so that that's going to be the way. Um, this is pretty much the end of what I've gotten up to so far. My next step from here is going to be analysing our job ads and like going through a text analysis and see what I can do from there. Um, changing our interview process so next month or maybe the month after I'll continue from here um, and see where I can go
Um, anyone got any questions or does anyone want to work for this lovely company? If it would be a headless picture. <laughs> so you bias, you drop the company name off there and say, like, hey, this looks all right. I'm sorry we don't have any more pictures in this, but you know. Good, good. Thank you.